Uh, great. All right. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about my study on the cross-sectional uh, relationship between indicators of household air pollution and lung health in children. Um, this seems to be a delay here. Um, but uh, I think all of you are, well, are aware that there's an increasing chronic lower respiratory health burden in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that also includes Uganda. Uh, a recent review of the literature indicated that um, the prevalence is highest in children compared to adults, and also that in urban areas, uh, the prevalence of asthma is higher. And we see that in Uganda as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Turenga recently showed that um, that's the case in Uganda. Um, and it's really asthma under-recognized, under-diagnosed, uh, and under-treated in the region. Um, and then also COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, um, is, is on the rise throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, including in Uganda. And uh, it, as this map is depicting, it's also uh, there's higher uh, pr uh, burden of COPD throughout this region. Um, so it's a very important uh, topic for uh, the population of Uganda and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, at large. Um, and then also uh, a little-known factoid is cough is the most commonly reported health complaint for folks coming into the Kampala Capital City Authority uh, health facilities. Um, as many, more than 300,000 cases of uh, no pneumonia cough or cold uh, uh, occurred in 2016. Uh, so it's a very important um, uh, issue here. And also, uh, I don't have a slide on it, but TB uh, also may be related to air pollution uh, is a very large burden here as well. Um, but in terms of cough, you know, such cases, when people come in complaining about cough, it often goes unexplained. Um, and household air pollution and outdoor air pollution may, may be an important culprit um, in this in these large number of complaints. Um, and then I think all of you probably know that there is an, the public health burden of uh, household air pollution is quite profound. Over three billion people use uh, you know polluting fuels such as kerosene. Um, you know, wood, charcoal is predominant here in, in, in Uganda. Um, and then uh, they use these for cooking, lighting, and heat in some parts of the world. Um, and the, the reason why this is a problem is this emits harmful chemicals and particulates into the air in people's homes. And uh, it's estimated that this air pollution kills up to 4, mil 4, 4 million people annually. Um, and nearly half of childhood uh, cases of pneumonia um, can be attributable to household air pollution in lower income countries. And this graph is just kind of depicting um, uh, of, of the proportion of uh, CVD and lower respiratory uh, uh, health conditions, so a significant proportion of these, for instance, low respiratory infection, um, COPD, and um, in, uh, people, uh, a significant proportion is estimated to be due to household air pollution. So it's a very significant issue for the region and globally as well. Um, and another little known factoid um, is that uh, East, Af East African region actually has the highest proportion of the population that uses solid fuels for cooking. Um, what this graph is showing you is that what you see is a downward trend for most other regions of the world, but what stands out is East Africa is pretty much, for the last few decades, is flatlined. So, there really hasn't been a move away from solid fuels in the region. So uh, almost 90% of the population uses it. In Uganda, it's even higher. It's about 95%. And the World Health Organization um, has estimated that up to 5% of Uganda's disease burden may be due to solid fuel use. Um, given this huge um, public health burden from household air pollution. There's a lot of initiatives to bring clean cook stoves, uh, to have interventions to reduce the public health burden, reduce the air pollution, but um, there's been a lot of mixed results with these interventions. And in Africa, it's been met with kind of um, uh, some, uh, I, I don't want to say failure, but uh, it hasn't had the results that we would hope, the benefits we hope to see. There was a large randomized uh, cluster trial in Malawi, um, uh, over 10,000 children uh, enrolled, and if the, the, the cook stove intervention failed to reduce the incidence of pneumonia in, in children under five. Uh, a recent study in uh, Kenya, um, they introduced clean cook stoves, and it failed to reduce the 
particulate matter levels below World Health Organization standards, and they believe this could be due to other fuel uses in the home, like kerosene for lighting the home, these sorts of things, which you're all familiar with. Um, and uh, there is also a growing outdoor air pollution burden in sub-Saharan Africa, including in Uganda. This uh, map is kind of showing you, uh, the areas in red represent uh, parts of the world where the particulate matter is above the World Health Organization standard for outdoor air pollution. And you can see your, your, your small little nook here of Uganda, you're, you're included in that part of the world that has the high outdoor air pollution. <coughs> and this other map is kind of depicting areas of the world where uh, age standardized death rates from air pollution and household air pollution combined. Um, uh, it's, this is shown in ge geographic distribution. And what we see again in Uganda, it kind of falls in that um, sub in that spectrum of countries that have a large uh, air pollution uh, death mortality burden. And, uh, you know, the, the issue of household air pollution is not an easy one to address. Um, as I kind of indicated earlier about these cookstove interventions, kind of targeting a cookstove, um, it, it, it may be insufficient when we consider all of the factors that go into people's exposure. Um, what this graph is uh, depicting and what guides my work in the study is that the, the household air pollution emissions and exposure to household air pollution these different factors will interact with each other. And what I mean by that is um, the, the type of cooking fuel that people use is related to their cooking load, where they do their cooking. Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? Is it in a small, confined living space? And um, not only are these related to each other, but there's an interaction between people's level of household air pollution exposure. Um, and there's other factors like ventilation, opening windows, having windows in the home, that influence where people cook. It influences the level of exposures that people will have. So this is a very complex problem. You layer on that, you know, how long do people burn their fuel? Are the people smoking indoors? There's a lot of factors that really determine people's household air, indoor air, air pollution rather than just simply a cook stove. Does that make sense? Um, and so this is what's guiding my work. And not only that, you also have, you know, contextual factors and individual level SES demographic factors that play a role in people's exposure to household air pollution. And to compound the problem, outdoor air pollution, right, can come inside. I'm sure you all know, you know, we keep our doors open all the time in Kampala, right? Um, I did um, household air pollution sampling, and every home had their door open all day. So that, those outdoor air pollutants are also coming in and affect people's household air pollution exposure. So it's a very complex problem that um, uh, comes with it a lot of variables that vary over space and time, um, uh, people's time activity patterns, the sources of air pollution, and the ventilation of people's home um, really are important factors to consider. And it's a high dimensional problem, very complex. And in the field of environmental health, where I hail from, uh, we're, we're very, uh, we're having to grapple with this problem of a large number of exposures. So how do we analyze the health effects from multiple environmental exposures? And this is, a, this is kind of that problem, right? Um, we have the curse of dimensionality, meaning we have a large number of exposures relative to our sample size. Um, we have, can have overfitting of our uh, if, uh, if, if regression effect models, right? Um, we can have collinearity in our exposure variables, meaning we have some variables that are highly related to each other, and you see that with this household air pollution problem. You have interaction effects or joint effects, and that just makes your problem of dimensionality even more com complicated. And then there's multiple testing. Um, if I have 10 or 12 different factors that I'm testing, um, that's increasing my chance of finding a false positive or some kind of health effect, right? Um, and then there's computational limitations. So this, these are very important problems in the field of environmental health, and uh, issues that I try to deal with in my work. Um, a recent uh, review article um, said, okay, well, depending on the research question, what are the best statistical methods, what are the available statistical methods to deal with this um, multiple exposures problem in environmental epidemiology? Um, and what this uh, review found um, is that Bayesian analysis and cluster analysis methods um, are particularly helpful 
when you have uh, when you're examining joint uh, effects, meaning the combined effects of multiple exposures, and when you have a complex exposure scenario, meaning um, a high dimension, more than 10 exposures. Um, and so, the work that I've done in the past and um, employed in this uh, study as well is using a method called Bayesian profile regression. Um, and I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on this so that you understand on, on a basic level uh, what this does. So I recently published a review looking at how multi modeling for examination of uh, subpopulations using profile regression can help us explore this multiple exposures and health outcome problem. So Bayesian profile regression basically is it's a clustering method of uh, different, of uh, multiple exposures. So how similar are people exposed? You know, people will be clustered together, or how different, so people will be clustered differently in different clusters, does that make sense? And, but not only that is, these clusters are linked with a health outcome of interest. So the clustering is partially determined by, you know, a health outcome, let's say, chronic cough or asthma. Um, and it's been used on a number of different uh, uh, settings. Um, and then there's something called an exposure profile. And an exposure profile, an individual will have um, exposure to um, multiple different factors or chemicals, right, um, in, a, in a day or over their lifetime. So that is, refers to somebody's exposure profile. Um, and so what this clustering is looking at, people with similar exposure profiles, so different levels of exposure to multiple factors. Um, and so this is showing you from, this is some output uh, from a, my, my review study where I looked at you know, neighborhood factors and air pollution and how they cluster together and what the, the risk of you know, living in an impoverished neighborhood is. So um, this is the method that I'll be spending some time in my results. I just want to introduce that now. Um, and there's important issues to be addressed in household air pollution that really have, have gone unaddressed. You know, what are the combined or joint health effects from multiple household air pollution? Exposure and emission factors. Um, how does exposure and emission factors cluster together, which I've kind of already talked about. Um, and are there exposure profiles of these household air pollution related factors that influence health risks? Um, so, uh, you know, is, what are the individual level factors, household level factors, neighborhood level factors? How do these come together to influence people's risk? Um, so these are some of the questions I'm interested in trying to address. So the study aims, um, now we're going to kind of transition here, um, you know, to examine the relationship between survey-based indicators of household air pollution and respiratory outcomes in children. So kind of first aim is kind of a traditional environmental epidemiology approach. Um, and then to examine the joint effects between these uh, household air pollution indicators and um, to identify clusters of exposure profiles for these household air pollution indicators and then to determine which exposure profiles are associated with adverse respiratory health risks. So those are kind of the, the, the four aims that I was um, looking at. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit on the methods. Um, so the, the study took place in Kampala. Um, it's an epidemiology study at uh, uh, three of the health, KCCA health facilities. So Chiswa, Chisenyi, and Kawala. Let's just kind of show you where they are throughout Kampala. Uh, basically, uh, community health workers uh, were um, uh, stationed at each of these facilities, and they would do face-to-face -face surveys with uh, parents of children under five, 15 years of age, and these were administered using a computer tablet by the community health workers. And this was a case control study, and the children um, were time and age matched, meaning um, you know, children that were visiting the health facility on the same day and were of a similar age, um, we recruited based on those factors. Um, so we had a screening procedure based on age, recruitment, you know, whether or not somebody has a cough so a case was a cough greater than or equal to two weeks, so at least two weeks. Um, and then uh, the control was a child that didn't have that condition. Um, and then we enrolled our case, case controls, so two controls for each case. And then um, the, this is kind of showing you the, the number of people that were enrolled into the study. 
we contacted 1,314 parents of children uh, to recruit into the study, and of those, uh, 1,294 uh, were enrolled into the study. So about 98% uh, enrollment rate, which is pretty good. I think we've done it for some reason we love participating in studies. If somebody knows why, but please tell me. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's great for folks who are, have these important research questions um, to try to address, right? Um, so the respiratory outcomes that we considered were acute prolonged cough, um, which is our case control um, uh, premise, uh, cough with phlegm, and then uh, asthma. And then, asthma. Um, and then the asthma was based off of the Isaac survey. And for those that don't know, Isaac is the international survey on asthma and allergies. Um, and it's kind of a standardized method for assessing asthma um, uh, symptoms in, in children um, in particular. Um, and this is kind of the, the de case definition. So wheeze in the last 12 months, or at least one of these other um, uh, respiratory symptoms. Um, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the cough and the asthma outcomes because we don't have limited time here. Um, and then these are the different household air pollution exposure categories that I assessed in my kind of you know logistic regression models and in the Bayesian profile regression. We have cooking location, fuel type, so the type of fuel that people are using, right? Um, the, the location of the child during cooking. That's a, that's it seems like something we should address, right? Um, the, the type of fuel for lighting the home. People, some people use a candle, kerosene, and most people use electricity. Um, and then survey-based indicators of traffic-related air pollution and trash burning. And the reason why I have to use a survey-based indicator is there is a, the, the, the air pollution monitoring network in Kampala is non-existent. So there is no kind of baseline or way for me to assess um, uh, air measurements of uh, air pollution. And I had a very limited budget, so I didn't like, deploy much of um, But nevertheless, um, uh, we asked people the level of concern about these two factors. Not concerned, somewhat concerned, or very concerned. And then the number of hours that people were burning their solid fuel. Um, some people will burn it for 12 hours, right? Some people will burn it for one hour. Um, we want to know that, because that'll affect the amount of emissions. And then uh, this is just showing you the, the, the data analysis to determine our covariates in the model. I used a Bayesian variable selection uh, approach, um, multivariate logistic regression for the main inference uh, in the study. And then Bayesian, Bayesian profile regression, where I did separate analysis for cough, a separate analysis for asthma. Um, so these are the domains that I considered. So these cooking domains at the household and individual level, um, other household air pollution related factors that we just kind of went over. Um, that's at the household and neighborhood level. And then socioeconomic factors at the household level, um, things like income, assets, and educational attainment. Um, so really interested in how these cluster together. So for my profile regression, that's what I looked at. Um, and now we'll jump into some results. Um, so um, obviously, uh, there was you know, since this is a case control study, um, uh, yeah, a third of the population had cough rate. Um, so uh, about 34 percent had cough rate in two weeks. About 26 uh, percent had cough with phlegm. And then um, about 20% had asthma um, based on our um, ISIC survey uh, and our algorithm that we used. Uh, the vast majority, unsurprisingly, cook with charcoal, 86%. How many of you cook with charcoal? Um, I do it sometimes in my home. Um, so there's, there's a few in here. Um, uh, wood was uh, ranked second, and then electricity uh, next, followed by kerosene and liquid petroleum gas. And keep in mind that these are folks at, from the KCCA facilities. This place that provides free healthcare services to people. So this is a very impoverished uh, population. I don't have data to just show that. I can't really show you. I haven't put that into the slides. But basically, 97% of the people in the study live on less than $2 a day. Two U.S. dollars a day, so very uh, so almost the entire study population was below the international poverty line, which is why you see such a high use of charcoal. Um, and then uh, the type of cooking stove, you know, ninety-four percent use some type of unvented traditional stove, and only six percent use some kind of improved stove. 
Um, the energy source for lighting was electricity was most common, and then can using a candle was fairly common, um, uh, and then kerosene lantern, these hurricane enclosed lanterns, and then the, the open wick or taduba traditional lanterns, uh, but clearly electricity was dominant. Uh, and then where do people cook? This is a very important question, I've already touched on it. Um, 41%, so cooking outdoors was the most common location of cooking, followed by cooking in the same sleeping area. Some people live in these very small, um, you know, you know the, there is no difference between the living area and the sleeping area, right? Um, and so uh, this was the second most common, this, and then 21% uh, um, had designated kitchen that they cooked in separate from the living area. And then some people cook uh, indoors, but in a separate or unattached um, uh, structure, right? So there's a wide variety here. So like in the US where I hail from, kind of you would pretty much see this like about 99% of people. So um, this is, uh, compared to the developed, kind of the higher income countries, excuse me, um, there's great variety of where people cook. Um, and then uh, the location of the child during cooking. 56% uh, of uh, the children were indoors during cooking times uh, based on their responses. Uh, so more than half were typically indoors during cooking. Um, about 25% did not have a window in the cooking area. Um, so they had no way to open uh, uh, their window for um, uh, natural ventilation. Um, so a quarter of the population was fairly high. Um, and then, um, about 44% reported always or most of the time using their window, um, and then 27% never used it. Um, so that's a large proportion that are never using their window that's available to them. Um, and about 92% smoked indoors. Um, I'm sorry, did not smoke indoors. So 8% had environmental tobacco smoke. So not particularly high, but, also, but it's important. Um, and this slide is just kind of showing you the distribution within the type of cooking fuel um, of where people cook. And so this really makes, drives home the point that these factors are really interrelated with each other. People who cook with charcoal, um, about half of them cook outdoors, okay? Um, and then about a quarter of them cook in the same living area that they, that they, um, that they uh, cook in. Um, and then the cooking location is dependent on income. Um, uh, what you see here is people who cook outdoors and people who cook in the same living or sleeping area, more than uh, the vast majority um, have very low income, okay? Make below 300,000 shillings per month. And then finally, um, for, the, for the location of child during uh, cooking times, um, the vast majority are children under five, uh, which intuitively makes sense, but it's something we need to keep, keep track of. Um, so these are so these are the effect estimates for the cough outcome, which was the, the case control study. Um, and what we see uh, is the odds ratio over four for smoking indoors. Uh, that shouldn't be surprising to folks. Uh, kerosene, using kerosene for cooking was an odds ratio of about three and a half, followed by cooking in the same living and sleeping area was an odds ratio of 2.7. So these are fairly large effect estimates. Um, and these are all statistically significant, including um, cooking in a separate structure, um, very, being very concerned about trash-related pollution, traffic-related pollution, all affect estimates of over two, odds ratio of over two. And then the location of the child during cooking was also significantly elevated for cough. Um, and then these other factors, including charcoal for wood, um, was elevated, but it wasn't significant. So, so you might be wondering why are we why is it statistically insignificant that um, when people are cooking with charcoal or wood, um, there's no, no association there, right? Well, there's a good reason for that. Um, so if we look at uh, the entire study population, this is the prevalence of cough um, among those who cook with electricity, kerosene, and solid fuel. And there's not much of a difference between these two groups, right? And that's, that, that was borne out by my uh, analysis. But when we focus on only those who cook inside, we see this disparity in cough um, compared to those who cook with electricity, those who cook with solid fuel. So there's an interaction here that we need to keep track of. Um, when I look at those who uh, only cook indoors, we see it's very similar to electricity. We see those who cook outdoors, right? We see that basically the same prevalence as those cooking with electricity. So we need to pay attention to how these, these, these 
factors uh, interact. And this is just showing you if I restrict the analysis to those who cook indoors, we see now we see a significant relationship between cooking with solid fuel um, and not. Uh, for the asthma um, outcome, again, we see, we see a similar uh, trend, smoking indoors, about 3.6 odds ratio. Um, cooking indoors, um, whether it's a separate structure or living, uh, same living area, you know, the odds ratios that are pretty high. Um, Trash-related pollution and traffic-related pollution are all significant. Um, lighting the home with kerosene or a candle compared to electricity was associated with odds ratio of almost two, um, and the location of the child indoors and trash related pollution um, and other factors were not statistically significant, um, including charcoal or wood, but I already kind of talked about this issue of interaction. Um, I also want to uh, point out that the number of hours that people cook with, cook with solid fuels, really matters. Um, this is showing you um, kind of a model is a continuous variable the number of hours cooking. And what it shows is that for each 10% increase in the number of hours cooking or burning solid fuels was a 1.4 odds ratio of cough and a 1.5 odds ratio for asthma. So how long people are burning the fuel seems to matter. And this is also showing you that um, the effect of the child indoors um, for asthma uh, it's really dependent on where the cooking is happening, right? Unsurprisingly, outdoors, there's, there's no effect. But when children are indoors during cooking in the living, and the cooking is done in the living and sleeping area, that's where we actually see um, a, a, a significant uh, adverse effect for asthma. Um, and then it's just showing you that window usage is significantly associated with cough and asthma. The, the, those who never use the window compared to those who always use their window, we see an odds ratio of 2.13. And then for those who use it sometimes, we see 1.81 and a similar trend for asthma. For those who never use their window, an odds ratio of 6.3, which is quite high. That's 600 higher prevalence of asthma in that, in that group. Um, and it's almost happening in a dose-dependent manner, uh, similar to that uh, burning issue, fuel burning issue. So now I'm going to talk about what I think is the meat of this um, presentation is the vegetation profile regression. So for the cough outcome, there were 12 total clusters uh, in these exposure profiles. And for asthma, there were 10 total clusters. And remember that the clustering is partially determined by the relationship between these factors and the outcome of interest. That's why you see a different number of clusters. Um, there were five clusters in the cough analysis that resulted in significantly elevated cough compared to the baseline prevalence of cough, um, and three that resulted in significantly lower cough. So these are potentially um, protective clusters, and these are the potentially the hazardous clusters. And then for asthma, we see three clusters that were in the hazardous, and three that were in the potentially pr protective cluster um, of the, the um, So when we say, okay, well, Let's say I set the, if I take the cluster that had the lowest prevalence of cough, right, at 21.4%, 20, and set that as my reference group, and um, focusing on kind of these, these high-end um, clusters, um, if I set them as the, uh, set this as the reference group, so the uh, cluster 12 has an odds ratio of 3.13.6, um, which is uh, basically, uh, you know, 100, 1,360% uh, higher um, prevalence of cough compared to this protective cluster. That's a very large effect estimate. Um, just keep that in mind. So 90% of the people in this cluster um, have cough, right? 81% in this next high-risk cluster 100% in this uh, high-risk cluster, but that was a very small cluster, just 12 children ended up in that cluster. Uh, so some uncertainty there. But this is to give you an idea of um, the, the risk associated with these clusters, okay? Now is the time when you say, okay, this is way too much information. Um, I uh, painstakingly um, went over what is the simplest way to present this information. And the honest answer to that is, this is a complex problem in this graph 
is clearly demonstrating that to you all. Okay. Um, these are the different um, exposures of interest. Um, okay. And they all have different categories. Okay. Um, you know, we've got location of cooking. We've got window usage. We've got trash air pollution. We've got education level of the household. So, uh, but here, this is great, but because we're, we're representing the individual level, we're representing the household level and the neighborhood level, um, which are all, it's important to take a multi-level approach. But nevertheless, um, so cluster 12, right? I'm going back here. Plus, we'll just kind of, I'll simplify things. We'll compare cluster 12 with cluster one and two, and cluster 11 with cluster one and two, okay? Um, so here's cluster one on the far left, cluster two here, and then cluster 11, cluster 12. Um, and so each of these exposure categories, you have an exposure profile um, for each of these different clusters. And they have very distinct, that's the whole point of the clustering, they have very distinct um, exposure patterns. Does that make sense? Okay, so for cluster 12, that was the high risk cluster. We see um, there's, Cooking outdoors is almost non-existent. Um, so cooking in a separate structure is elevated. Cooking in a kitchen is elevated. Um, in the sleeping area, it's kind of uh, average compared to the regular rest of the population. Uh, cluster 11, which was also a high-risk cluster. Keep in mind, these are all um, these clusters are in order of risk. Okay. Um, you see cluster 11, which was a very high-risk cluster. Most of those people cook in the same sleeping area that they live, uh, in, that they live in, right? Um, compare that to cluster one and two, you see these people, 100% of them cook outdoors. Okay, you see that? Um, I don't necessarily have time to go through over each individual exposure, okay? But uh, the child indoors is very important, um, as was shown in that kind of uh, same, you know, uh, multiple uh, re regression analysis. Smoking indoors is very important. Um, window usage turns out to be quite important, um, uh, kind of more so than I was anticipating. Um, and then uh, the, the, the using a, pollute, a, a lighting fuel that pollutes the air, um, so a candle or kerosene was very common in this high-risk cluster, and whereas uh, electricity was more common. Uh, almost 100 people in the cluster one used electricity for electricity. Um, traffic air pollution was elevated in um, the, uh, the two highest risk clusters. And uh, one interesting thing that I do want to note is, remember cluster two was uh, a, a protective cluster, okay? Um, and these people predominantly cooked outdoors. And cluster two, all, even though it was a, a protective cluster, it was a very impoverished cluster and had very, very, it had the lowest, um, uh, very low assets, very low income and very low education. So, um, and similar to this higher risk clusters, they had similar poor SES, meaning um, you can't really attribute, it's hard to say this is attributable to SE, socioeconomic factors. It's, it's clearly there's something going on with these combined uh, household uh, factors. Um, there's a lot more to unpack here, but in the sake of time, I'm gonna move on to the asthma outcome, which I actually think is a little more interesting. Um, so uh, again, I've color coded these. So red is bad, blue is good. Okay. Um, so cluster ten uh, had an odds ratio of thirty-seven point nine compared to the protective cluster, our reference cluster. So ninety percent of the people in that cluster um, have asthma based on our, our algorithm that we used. Um, so almost everybody. Similar for cluster nine, eighty-eight percent. Whereas the protective cluster, only 2.2% um, had asthma. So you see, you see these huge disparities um, between these uh, people with very different exposure profiles. Um, so, I mean, a fairly similar pattern emerges compared to that last slide that I just showed you. So I'm not going to be, belabor the point. Um, uh, but again, you have this issue of you have a low risk cluster that is also poor. Right. So again, it's hard to attribute this to socioeconomic status. So one of the things I think this method is particularly good at is kind of um, saying, okay, let's set aside socioeconomic status as a cause for these differences in respiratory health. This is kind of saying we've accounted for it. Okay, we have people with similar SES, but very different exposure profiles and hugely different 
um, uh, prevalence of these different uh, uh, respiratory health outcomes. Um, again, traffic related pollution almost in like a dose dependent manner. Um, uh, it's the same thing for uh, uh, indoor smoking and the child indoors during cooking. Um, you know, my next step in this analysis is to, um, there's ways you can test for interaction. It's very complicated and I'm not gonna totally get into it, but there's ways you can test for interaction. You can hold certain variables um, uh, in place and, and vary others and see the interaction between these different uh, factors. Um, but you also can do prediction, prediction scenarios and say, well, what if I intervene on these three factors do I get a reduction in the prevalence? What if I intervene on two factors or all the factors? Um, so that's something that's in that kind of work I hope to do down the road. Um, but just to reemphasize that these are huge differences in um, uh, prevalence of these uh, of the asthma outcome, and something that is typically not seen. A case control study, um, you're liable to see effect estimates. Um, the high range would be about seven. Okay. Um, so this is extraordinarily high. Um, so some conclusions. Uh, okay, I should wrap up. So several ha hazardous household um, cooking related behaviors like the child indoors, um, cooking inside, and other factors like um, no windows or not using the windows, indoor smoking, uh, using a polluting fuel for the, to light the home, outdoor air pollution indicators, these can cluster together. And that's where you see the majority of the, the, the cases, okay? I, I don't think we should take that as a surprising finding, but just the, the, the point that it makes is that intervention strategies should probably be focusing on the ha hassle of air pollution and emission factors um, uh, together rather than intervening on one single factor. And that's work that I'm going to be pursuing in the future is, um, let's say, let's, let me compare a multimodal intervention compared to just replacing somebody's cook stove with a more efficient cook stove. Um, and so that's work that I hope to be doing in the near future. And also this analysis kind of shows you, it bears light, or lays there. We need to move past the single exposure paradigm and use the power of Bayesian analysis, cluster analysis, to look how combined exposures contribute to risk, right? This can yield kind of mechanistic insights. So you can do this on a biological, um, in the biological realm, but also identify susceptible sub subpopulations that you can target limited resources to. So I, I think when you see it, when you see odds ratios, you know, assuming this my data gets replicated in other studies, um, when you see effect estimates like that you might want to target those folks that um, have this clear disparity. Um, so uh, that's another benefit of using these uh, multi-exposure uh, expert approaches. Um, and some of the future work I want to do is looking at, and I have a lot of the data to do this, of social and spatial determinants of cooking fuel and lighting fuel use in Uganda, um, the spatial, social and spatial determinants of tuberculosis in Kampala, um, and then developing a low-cost PM air monitoring network in Kampala to inform a citywide exposure model. So I'm working with some ex some computer scientists at McCary University on de developing a low-cost air monitoring network, um, and then out more air, and then doing outdoor air pollution respiratory health effects studies, looking at tuberculosis in particular, um, and, and, and evaluating susceptibility to respiratory effects from air pollution. Um, and just got, I recently published a review article, um, basically finding that there's very few outdoor epidemiology, outdoor air pollution epidemiology studies in Sub-Saharan Africa, and there's none that have been published in Uganda. Um, so this represents a major gap in the literature. Um, so one of the reasons uh, why I'm interested in doing this, you can see for, for all of East Africa, uh, we identified only one study that was in Kenya that examined this question. Um, and then of the respiratory, uh, of the health outcomes considered, only five of these studies considered uh, respiratory health outcomes. And most of them were basically symptom based. Um, the vast majority were you know, cough, wheezing, kind of like bronchitis, similar to the stuff that I did in my study. Whereas diagnosis based outcomes were rarely. Um, assessed and measurement-based outcomes like lung function, um, these sorts of things were, were rarely addressed in these studies. So th there's, 
this review has identif identified some gaps and where we can target some of our research efforts in the document. And um, uh, thank you NIH for providing me the uh, funding to do this research. Um, uh, this content is solely the responsibility of the authors. It doesn't necessarily represent uh, National Institutes of Health. Um, but a special thanks to the collaborative organizations, McCary University, School of Public Health, UC Berkeley, uh, Yale, uh, my mentor right here, uh, Lisa Davis, who came to Uganda just for this presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Kampala City Capital, uh, Kampala Capital City Authority, who let my research staff go in there and, and go in every day to collect data, um, uh, and the peer health study staff, um, is Sam here, I'm not sure. Um, but also the research staff, so I had some community health workers help me on the study, the mentor team, including and Achilles, you probably all know Achilles, and then uh, the commotion field office, those are the folks that really played a role in uh, getting me, getting my feet wet and getting the ground running when I got here, so uh, that's all I have for you, so thank you.